And what scene is a bit of game, right? Really, but of course there's French in it. And, uh, you know, does the shamrock make it Gaelic revival? But perhaps it does, because the shamrocks are on kind of strings, and there is a stone down in the back there, which was done in about 1870-1890, where if you don't go and have a look afterwards, you'll see shamrocks on strings, scraped into the stone. Now, and the idea of Celtic art within, or modern Celtic art within the stone, not the idea, excuse me, but the, 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 the presence of it comes from different media people doing it in different media. So you have Papa Colfin Stucco work, but you do have a little heart here in iron work. It's, it's a nothing burger, if you like, but it's worth mentioning, it does exist. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this design, and a lot of people think it's Celtic. And I'm here to tell you the good news and the new news that no, it's not. It's Viking, and some of you may have heard it was Viking, but we have discerned it is from the Isle of Man. I'll get to that in a second. Here we have the top of the Emporium, which is obviously an American um, eagle there, and there you have E Pluribus Unum, which means out of many, one. Right? And you have more, sorry, the buttons are new to me on this, you have more chain work here, which is known in the Isle of Man colloquially as underpants chain work. And I'm sure you can figure out why. <laughs> it is the one of that was, to my knowledge, the only example of this type of chain work in Ireland. It can be found all over the place in the Isle of Man, but not necessarily in Ireland, until I realised there was a second example of it. And it was in this stone. So in fact, this stone is owner to the only two examples of underpants chain link in Ireland. One of them attributed to McAuliffe and the other to whomever did the painting in down, downtown. Now, where, when, I, when I say that they're Viking and they're from the Isle of Man, there's a reason for it. What you have here is Olaf's cross. Okay, that's the inspiration, and I know now it is the inspiration. I, I found out today for sure. It's the inspiration for the chain work on the harp and lion down the side. If you look, you'll, you'll see sort of diamond shapes in the harp and lion. We can go back to it there. See it? And then we have the underpants chain link, and that's from Thor's Cross on the Isle of Man and also from the Manx Notebook, which is dated 1901 here, but obviously came out in 1886. And you even have it on the back of the Manx Powell Note. So, how did McAuliffe get his hands on that? Well, McAuliffe sub subscribed to a magazine called The Builder. It's the earliest known business-to-business magazine uh, that has been in, in, in the UK from 1830 something, and there was an article in it in the mid 1880s by a man called Archibald Knox, who was a famous designer in the Isle of Man and head of Liberty Design in London thereafter. And he did an article on Viking crosses in the Isle of Man. And this was presented, this was presented in, uh, there was a drawing of it as well. And we know that that's where he got his, his, his inspiration from because the McCauliffe family have confirmed to me today, or at least Mc, he's not McCauliffe, but Warren um, Buckley has confirmed to me today that there were uh, issues of the builder going around the family in the 80s and they no longer exist. Now, let's go on to the next one. Central Hotel, it's another instance of multiple designs creating one work. You, you have your Scandinavian chain work here. You have the Maid of Air, the Nair Sorry. So, now that's terrible. I'm sorry about this, but it hasn't transferred properly from whatever 
thing. I have a e pluribus unum, or e unum pluribus. e pluribus unum is out of many comes one. And what I'm going to suggest is that actually it could reasonably be e unum pluribus, which is out of one came many, and that means that out of one of came many other. Over the years. Now, we have Paddy Whelan, and we're only going to put the one up of Paddy Whelan. Yes, he did a lot of work around town, and yes, he did a little bit of change work around town. This is perhaps what he's best known for. It's the Tampoline Ball, built in 1932. It's, a, it, it, it's out in the Fannin graveyard. Okay? So he's, he came directly after McAuliffe and um, did well. Now, we come on to the Michael O'Connor, who was born here in the house. And I, I suppose this is a story of discovery. It's a, it's a, it's a story of coming home. Back in 2019, uh, I had found a file in my father's um, library. And in the file, there were a number of artworks. Sorry, I'm struggling here a little bit. But uh, in, the, in the file there were a number of artworks, and um, they were absolutely amazing. They took me by storm, really. I think this is one. Okay, so what I found in these files are obviously what's the letter P, and they're absolutely, their brilliance took over me, really. And I felt I had to do something about them. And then you have some zoomorphics here, and what I'm sure of is the letter A and the letter N for an Amitas. And Dominica, I think, will uh, demonstrate later on where in the Book of Kells a couple of these two can be found. And I made an error with this one. This is the letter to Z from Zachariah, and I had seen it flipped. It looked to me for a long time like the letter P, or perhaps even the letter L, until it took me a year, and I should have known better, but after a while, you know, you don't tend to, uh, to, ask, or to, to ask the silly, simple questions, because you might end up looking like an Egypt. I ended up looking like an Egypt, telling somebody it was a, a P, and it wasn't, it's a Z. And here you have some of the zoomorphics, and I, I think you can appreciate that when you find something and you're not particularly into art or Celtic art, you find something like this with brilliance such as that, it does generate an, an interest in you. It's something that you never thought you'd catch a hold of, but it certainly has. I've, I've grown up in Celtic art. My father has uh, lectured on Celtic art, but I dismissed it, perhaps because he was a parent, you know. But when you find something like this, and it's on vellum, and it's done like, a, you know, it was done 50 years ago, but it was like it was done yesterday, it really does take over. Here you have the, le the letter M, and you have the, from the Book of which you will see later, and the first instance of an anthropomorphic done by O'Connor, which is um, quite a good one, actually. No. I keep going back. Here is the piece that we, the piece that we have presented tonight. It's the alphabet. I'm not entirely sure that it's the Irish alphabet, Latin alphabet, certainly not the English alphabet. It's got A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then there's a H, so it can't be the Irish alphabet. The Irish alphabet has a pool of Irish in Then you have H, I, L, so there's no J. Uh, L, M, N, O, P, and this thing here, which I thought was a G for years, is actually a Q. I don't know what this is, but you have the rest of the alphabet, R, S, T, U, V, and there's X and Z, there's no W, there's no Y. So I've yet to show you exactly which alphabet it is, but you can see that it's a fabulous piece of work. Uh, I, I might be educated later on on, on what alphabet it is, and I would love to be, because this isn't just a, an information giving session, this is an information collecting session, and I'm hoping to collect information from you later on. 
Here's your letter Q, which for lots again, we come to thinking something was something for so long that you don't want to look stupid and asking the question of what is it? It's Q. I thought it was G for lots of two or three years, I think. And uh, we move on from my mistakes. I know a little bit better now. Now, this one, again, it's another mistake that I thought was perhaps the letter A, or perhaps the number 6, it's something called ampersand. Ampersand is that squiggle that uh, it's ant. Here you have ampersand in the Book of Kells, and here you have ampersand by Michael O'Connor. Now, the Book of Kells is a sort of a Mozart, and I think Michael O'Connor is more Elvis. Uh, he's, he's certainly the Book of Kells on steroids, if you like. Now, I want to give it just a five minute, or sorry, five second thing, just to show you that a lot of knot work is done and was done in the Book of Kells as well, and as far back as that, by using grids. Okay? It's a bit like join the dots and go from there. But, Michael O'Connor, now that we know from these pieces he left on his desk when he died, which were unfinished, Michael O'Connor never used grids. Essentially, he did it all by eye, all by hand, all by freehand, which was an amazing skill. The only other person I know that did that was um, Arthur Wiener, who, who did Lauren Hashari, in case any of you know that one. No. So I found an article by my father, <coughs> written in 1972, which mentioned O'Connor. And going back to the mention of Laura Maharshari, I'll go to this sentence here, where it says, Nonetheless, should Laura Maharshari be bound as a single book, then his illuminated breastplate of St. Patrick and his Eamon de Valera, President of Ireland, could fittingly be incorporated to fill up two major gaps in the book. Now, when you find a file full of artwork and you read that piece that said, this guy did two pieces that could be in Laura Nahashari, and I've heard of Laura Nahashari, it's up in Collins Barracks, in Dublin, then you realise you might have something special. So, on we go through the file, and we found a letter from a man called Morris Friedberg to the President of Karun on the uh, on his inauguration. All these pieces that had come into the file were given by Michael O'Connor's wife to Morris Friedberg and my father on his death, and they charged themselves with finding a home for it and to elevate his work. So to find a home, they thought in 74 that they would present it to Carol and Dolly and it would end up in Morris Luthron and therefore have a home. But of course, as we all know, Carol Carol O'Dolly resigned two years later and Oris and Uthron said, we can't keep these now. So they sent them all back to my father. So when we found this file, I had said to my mother, look, I'd like to do something with this. It took a while to get an offer. Um, <laughs> but she relentlessly relented. And I said, you know, Michael O'Connor. And she says, oh, I think he did a piece for us for our wedding. And it turns out he did. It was a Michael O'Connor piece hanging on the wall throughout my whole life. And I never realized it, even though I had to remember this piece, but it never struck me. It is a fabulous paper blessing of my parents' marriage in 1967. In fact, here's my mother's wedding dress. She won't mind me introducing it there. And it's well worth a look afterwards for a piece of modern kind of art. Some nice knot work on it. So, in, I set out to find out who Michael O'Connor was. And it was a very difficult ordeal to, 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 to try and find out where he was from because there was no information in this file. My father was not dead. So there's nothing coming from him. And how many Michael O'Connors are in the country or were in the country? Well, I met a Michael O'Connor today sitting on a, on a bench outside. That tells you the difficulty that I may have had. So a year and a half. And I picked up in another part of the office a postcard or a Christmas card, postcard, and on the back it says, Art by Mihal Kruhor, and the Versi by Breen Mahuna. So after a year and a half, uh, Breen Mahuna, I was going to start to Google in because I had got nothing. 
out of Michael O'Connor. There was no mention of him at all in the arms or anything you like. Wasn't out there at all. Green MacMahon, Brian MacMahon, I found out that he had some children who were still alive. And I telephoned Owen MacMahon, his sister, who's in Limerick, and uh, he informed me that he knew of Michael O'Connor. He was born in the house that is now the Kerry Writers Museum. Voila, Takshe Walia. And obviously, with the word museum in it, my ears pricked up. He was from Listowel. That's brilliant to know. But the charge that was given to my father and Morris Friedberg of finding a home for the works, well, that was complete because no matter what the museum were going to say, they were going to be given the works. So it was the obvious place for it. Now, going from there, to understand how difficult it was, sorry, I had later been introduced to this programme, which was uh, an O'Connor cover that he did in 1960 for the local GA pitch. And inside, there's um, a page about the author. And one of the, uh, the only quote that you get out of Michael O'Connor was, I had the good fortune to be born in Listowel. And that, I think, about covers everything. Everything after that is anti-climax. That's an incredible low quote. You know, even to his local town, he wasn't giving out information. And one of the themes of the letter to the president was by Morris Friedberg was I worked with him 20 years but I know nothing about him. So I tried to find out about Michael O'Connor who never said anything. It's a difficult deal. But it, it did open up the floodgates once I talked to him that man. It was fantastic. And then I, I had a chat with different people around my store. I was informed that he had family and uh, it, it opened up the floodgates essentially. Now, it, it, I, when I was informed he was, had family, I, I spoke with Father Brendan O'Connor, who's already said a few words up here. Brendan told me I have a piece of his. It's our family heirloom. It's called Saint, the Breastplate of St. Patrick. This is the one mentioned by my father in the 72 article as being worthy of inclusion in Lower Mahash Abbey. Now, it's there. You can have a look at it. Please don't touch it. It's incredibly important. It's, uh, I, I, I was visiting my cousin, Connor Newman, who's the former chair of the National Heritage Council. I said, Connor, you know, what can you say about this? Can they call it a national treasure? And he said, Stephen, there's no criteria for national treasure, but I would not object to the term being used for this. So this is what you have. It's, it's an incredible piece. As you can see yourself, you'll see it later on. It's, it's, it's on paper, though. It's not on vellum, unfortunately. But it was made for the patrician year of 1961, when that cardinal from Rome came over. I, I, I fail to remember his surname, but it's a funny one. Aginian. Aginian. There you go. It was made in the patrician year 1961, which was uh, a thousand years after the death of St. Patrick. <laughs> there you go. And it took a long time to make that. You can be sure, and, uh, especially as Michael O'Connor came home at night time after his day's work in the Department of Industry and Commerce and after putting his children to bed, he'd sit down at his desk and then he'd carry on till as, as, as late as three o'clock in the morning. So he must have done this over many, many months because doing that, and especially doing that without grid work, takes some doing. It's, it's not just artistry, it's craftsmanship, it's, it, it's, it's everything, you know, and the, the, the colour scheme that he has. He used to mix his own colours with pestle and mortar, you know. The whole thing. And, and what he used to use was a quill. Now, I know we're in the Writers' Museum, and the quill is featured in the, 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 the Writers' Week logos and, and things like that. I bet O'Connor was the only one who actually used a quill. And there you can see some detail. And you can see there how big it actually is. But to get that detail, and look at that knot work. That's done without grid work. That's just, uh, he was a trained architect, so perhaps that helped. He was down in the Crawford College of Art. But all of this was done without grid work to help. And even the Book of Kells had grid work done it. 
Oh. oh, getting to the brazen head that Jimmy's already talked about. I hope no one and recognise this. This was a commission by Jewel Company Limited, uh, who commissioned O'Connor to make a piece for what is regarded as one of the oldest pubs in Ireland, and it's certainly the oldest licensed pub in Ireland. And it was given over, and it, it mentions down there the Miss McHugh, which I think is your granddad, am I right? Yeah, yeah, Miss McHugh, of over 90 years old, I think so. Yeah. So, like all good manuscripts, it got some um, water damage. Now, I'll explain that. The Book of Kells has water damage. The Book of Lindisfarne has water damage. The Book of Durrow has got water damage. And Michael O'Connor, not to be all done, flooded the Liffey, and over it came into the brazen head, got a bit of water damage, and much to uh, your uh, credit to your father, he produced a replacement. And this is the original one which O'Connor took back, and obviously it remained out for me, and it's with your niece over in America. And I'm trying hard to get it over here. You know, it's being restored. Great. We'll see it soon then. But now, um, so once I got into the O'Connor family and got in contact with Father Brendan, yeah, he introduced uh, this, the, the, these finds to a whole host of his cousins and, and all sorts of people. They all said, oh yeah, yeah, go ahead and get to it. Michael did a bit for us and, uh, and we have this bit. And these are all uh, fairly decent bits. You know, I mean, we're not talking the, the, the breath play here, but it's pretty good. And you can see it's pretty good. So when you get to that and you have the breastplate, and then you have the 12 or 13 pieces that came in from the file, you're pretty sure you have a full collection. And you thought the job was done because essentially you didn't want to leave the Kerry Writers Museum with, with, with you know, a dozen pieces and, 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 and a very good piece in, in the breastplate of St. Patrick. But when you get another dozen, um, you think, yeah, that's a, that's a good collection that they can actually swap around, they can run over a few years, they can do all sorts of things with it. So I was happy, I thought the job was done. But I was very wrong. <laughs> uh, Dave O'Sullivan, hello, down there somewhere, decided to go looking up the newspaper archives and found a whole lot about O'Connor. Now, my resources were zero, so I didn't have access to newspaper archives. I wasn't going to pay 200 euros a year for uh, for, 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 for the privilege, and I should have because I lost out on an awful lot of time. But thank you, Dave O'Sullivan, for all your finds uh, because he really has enthusiastically taken on his part and, and he's come up with all sorts of wonderful things. I mean, does anybody remember these? Yes, the entrance signs. The entrance signs to the town. The entrance signs to the town, signed by Michal Crowher. What we have here, has anybody heard of Rhineway Boathouse? Rhineway Boathouse um, did a podcast about three or four years ago, and his father worked in Shannon Airport. Now, O'Connor got a commission back in 64, 65, to commission the carpet for the VIP lounge in, in, in Shannon Airport, and it lasted there until about 1990, where they were going to throw it out, we went into the skip, and Brian by Boathouse's father took it out of the skip, brought it home and relayed it in the sitting room. And Brian by Boathouse grew up getting down his knees and sniffing it, thinking he was sniffing you know, um, Michael Jackson running across the thing or, or some pop star the Beatles had walked across this. And that's how he lived his youth. And he used to go to school and say, you know, the Beatles walked across my living room. And, and this was said Years ago, before I ever started on the train by my boathouse, turns out Michael O'Connor designed that floor, or that carpet, excuse me. Now, there's another piece here which I'm still looking for. It's public in the hair. It was done for the 1966 commemorations uh, of the 1916 writing. It's, uh, <coughs> it's pretty hard to lay my hands on it. Um, it, it shouldn't be because it was used in a major exhibition in 1966. But I have a funny feeling it was brought home and is in somebody's, on somebody's wall or in somebody's attic, if you like. Now, get down to here. Here we have the representatives of the Jewish community in Ireland presenting 
what's called Book of Honour to Emma de Valera. And my father in that article in 72 had, had referred to a piece called David de Valera, President of Ireland. He got it wrong. It wasn't called David de Valera, President of Ireland. It was actually Book of Honour for David de Valera on the occasion of the naming of his forest in Israel. So at least I had a trail then on what I was actually looking for, because I'd wasted time looking for this piece called the Emma de Valera, President of Ireland. Now, we'll get to that book of honour in a second, because we have to deal with Trinity College first, and, <coughs> excuse me, in 66, I think it was, Trinity ran uh, a fundraising scheme uh, for the new library, and the idea was that you would put your name here on this book plate, you would put it into a book of your choice in the Trinity Library, and you'd give a donation and that would all go through the new library. So the very first book plate, of course, was Eamon de Valera. And who did Eamon de Valera commission for his book plate? Only Miwana Prohora. So that one is in a book called uh, Elements of Caternance by Sir William Rowan Hamilton who was a mathematician, and a probably book, because, of course, De Valera was a mathematician. And every other one is a copy of that, where you'd, you'd buy a copy, you'd give your five pounds, or whatever it was, you'd write your name in it, and then it goes into a book. But it's nice to know that the President of Ireland was directly commissioning 